Well, we pre uh, appreciate Danny uh, coming to join us today with Habitat for Humanity. And um, I personally am le really looking forward to this program because, you know, I've heard about Habitat for years. Um, and I'll be honest, I don't know that I know enough about it to say I know about it. So um, I'm looking forward to this pro uh, presentation. And um, Danny, I don't know if, if you were told that we do um, record this and we share it on our Kiwanis um, Facebook page. So hope that's all right with you. I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself and we'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm very glad to be with you virtually today. Would be a lot nicer in person, but such are the times. So here we are. Um, I'm Danny Ackright. I'm the Director of Communications for Greater Des Moines Habitat for Humanity. I've been with the organization for almost two years. And prior to that was a volunteer with the Young Professionals uh, branch of the volunteer service at, at Habitat. So um, I'm thrilled to, to be able to share some information about what we have done in the, in the recent times and what we're looking forward to do with you. So we'll go ahead and get started. So our mission at Habitat is seeking to put God's love into action. Habitat for Humanity brings people together to build homes, communities, and hope. And our vision is a world where everyone has a decent place to live. We are a Christian organization, but we serve people of all faiths and no faith. We'll, uh, we'll start with talking a little bit about the need and why uh, an organization like Habitat is necessary. Um, so right here in central Iowa, and we serve Polk, Jasper, and Dallas counties, um, there are more than 11,000 low-income families that are stuck in, in what's considered cost-burdened rental situations. So that means that they're paying 30% or more of their income toward housing. Um, and in neighborhoods where, where we focus most of our work, more than one in four homes are in need of repair to preserve the home or maintain a basic level of safety. So they need a new furnace, new siding, new windows, all kinds of things uh, to make sure that that home is safe and stable and that the person that owns it can continue living there. In uh, Polk County, thousands of working families don't earn enough to qualify for a traditional mortgage. And that's kind of where we come in. We help bridge that gap. Um, one in eight families spend 50% or more of their income on housing, uh, which wow. is considered severely cost burdened, uh, forcing them to make decisions between other necessary expenses, healthy foods, health care, reliable transportation, good education. Um, so one of the things we like to do is, is have you think about which one of these would you choose uh, to sacrifice in order to ensure that you had a safe home. Um, it's, it's not a choice anybody wants to make. It's a very tough position for, for folks to be in. So no one should have to pay more than 30% of their income to afford a home. This situation is not getting any better. Um, as the last year has shown us, home is extremely important. And um, you know, we're, we're going to, I think, face the consequences of a lot of, uh, a lot of additional problems as Rent comes due as the, the eviction moratoriums lift, uh, maybe later this year, things are just gonna get worse. But before that even, there was a prediction uh, that in the next 20 years, central Iowa need, will need to add 57,000 new housing units to accommodate new workers in the region. Um, so, you know, we are a, a quickly expanding region unlike some other parts of the state. Um, we need housing to, to be able to you know, give homes to those workers that are that are coming in. Um, of these, more than 33,000 units will need to be new owner-occupied uh, as opposed to a rental. More than half of the demand for owner-occupied homes is for those priced below $175,000. I don't know if any of you have spent much time on Zillow or looking at real estate listings recently, but there are very, very few homes in the metro that are listed under $175,000. And those that are tend not to be in uh, the most impeccable shape. Um, so th this, this uh, lack of quality affordable housing is, is a serious issue. So why, uh, why are we here? Why do we exist? And why are we an important player in helping people uh, you know, get access to affordable housing? So housing provides stability, safety, and self-sufficiency to homeowners. And we know that it is the best way to build and transfer wealth between generations. As equity accrues in a home and then parents are able to pass that down to children, that builds over generations. It means that people are able to you know, afford a college education more affordably. They're able to maybe help with a down payment for their children's own homes um, and things like that along the way. 
Our model helps make homeownership possible by providing a hand up, not a handout. We sell our homes with an affordable mortgage to the folks that we work with. We do not give them a home. Uh, and we have a proven history of success helping people achieve their homeownership goals. We've been in, in operation since 1986. And uh, this last year, we celebrated our 400th completed home. Um, and we've got some, some incredibly impactful programs in addition to that homeownership side as well. So let's talk about uh, our three main areas in which we help Central Iowans. Homeownership is the one that you probably associate with Habitat. Um, and this, again, goes back to uh, participating families and individuals that are living in substandard and or cost burdened housing. So when we say substandard, it might be that um, the quality of the house or, or the, the rental unit is, is in poor shape. It could be that they have a larger family living in a smaller place, say a family of six living in a two or three bedroom apartment. Um, and then cost burdened housing is that 30 percent or 50 percent or more of their income going toward housing. And participants are selected based on three criteria after they apply for our program. One is need. Um, so they've demonstrated that substandard housing or that cost burdened housing. Second is willingness to partner. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then third is ability to pay. As I said, we don't give our homes away. We sell them with an affordable mortgage and we work with our families to make sure that the mortgage is, is positioned in a, in a way that will be affordable to them and allow them to help build wealth their family in the next generation. So in terms of uh, willingness to partner, before purchasing our, our participants complete the Blueprint to Homeownership course and 300 to 400 hours of sweat equity. So that Blueprint to Homeownership course covers how to be a homeowner. You know, what, what do you need to pay attention to? How often do you need to replace your furnace filters? How do you repair certain things within your home? How, how, are you, how do you be a good neighbor? Uh, you know, how do you engage with, with the neighbors around you? Uh, and that 300 to 400 hours of sweat equity, they'll go on to our build sites and work on either their home or another partner family's home to help build that, uh, that house. So through that, we've, we've heard from our families that they get to be pretty comfortable with how their house is constructed. They get familiar with, you know, the ins and outs of, of how it's framed and insulated and all, all of that kind of stuff that they might need to repair in the future. So they feel more comfortable when they become a homeowner. And then they purchase the home with an affordable mortgage um, and volunteer support and sponsorships help us uh, ensure that we can offer those affordable mortgages. And in the last couple of years, we've actually turned to uh, and developed partnerships with local banks and, and credit unions to purchase the affordable mortgages from us as soon as we uh, finalize those with the family. What that allows us to do is rather than having you know, a slow trickle of money coming in over 30 years for the, the life of the mortgage, we're able to recoup that cash immediately and put that toward more houses. So this has allowed us to speed up the pace at which we've been, uh, we've been able to build our homes and, and complete our programs. This last year, we completed 24 affordable homes, including our 400th home. Um, of those 24, 19 had closed by the end of the year and the remaining uh, five of those are, have either closed so far in 2021 or are just about to. So, um, we completed those homes and we immediately got to work on, on the next batch and uh, our building doesn't stop during the cold weather. Our second uh, major program is what we call Rock the Block. This is a home repair program to help people stay in their homes. Um, so we partner with families to, to assist with repairs, weatherization and accessibility. Great example of accessibility, we build a lot of ramps. So people who may have lived in their home for, for a couple decades and want to stay there into um, you know, older age or limited mobility, we will help them stay in their home by making it you know, more accessible to get in and out of that home. Uh, weatherization will help them replace drafty windows or uh, insulation, things like that, so that they can stay in a more comfortable, more cost efficient home. And then repairs, you know, something's gone wrong and we're here to help uh, fix it. Our partner families for Rock the Block, Rock the Block, excuse me, qualify financially by earning at or below 60% of the area median income. Uh, these families also, just like the, the homeownership families that do their sweat equity, um, these families invest their time and resources into the repairs. So they, they volunteer, I believe it's six hours with us, um, working on either their own repairs or, uh, or another project with us. 
Um, and some, some examples of some of our rock the block projects include window replacement, siding repair and replacement, roof replacement, accessible ramps, exterior painting. Um, what you can see in the photo right there is a, a, an exterior door replacement that was over in uh, near the Birdland neighborhood um, this summer. So you can kind of see the, the gator around uh, Tom's neck with our back to us and, and all of our volunteers had masks on for this as well. Last year in 2020, we completed more than 220 home repairs through the Rock the Block program. Um, I think this is especially remarkable in a year where home became so much more critical, it became schools and offices and places of refuge. And we were able to safely come and help people fix their homes to be more comfortable while they were you know, spending more time there. Our uh, third major program is Financial Foundation for Success. This is an educational program that ha helps people understand finances and credit and savings and how to move forward toward their financial goals, which, which many times includes home ownership. Um, so one of the main ways that we have people referred to the Financial Foundation for Success program is that they have been declined from our home ownership program. So if you remember, one of those key characteristics for people to, to be accepted into that program is ability to pay. If during that application process, we have determined that their income or their uh, credit score or whatever it might be doesn't qualify them for a house, we'll refer them to this, uh, what we call Triple FS, Financial Foundation for Success. And they'll work through this group course and one-on-one -on -one counseling with our, our qualified financial educators and start working toward that goal. And we have seen a number of folks who've completed the Triple FS program go on to become Habitat homeowners. So we know that that program works and helps people achieve those financial goals. When they start the program, they set a financial goal, um, typically reducing debt, increasing savings, or increasing their credit score um, to better their housing situation. And then our coaches will kind of track that with them. They'll check in and see how are they doing and help them you know, make course corrections as needed. Here are some examples of the goals that participants have achieved, paying off delinquent debts, clearing up collections, establishing retirement savings for the first time, paying off credit cards and vehicles, raising credit scores, increasing savings, and moving on to our home ownership program. Um, this is, we've heard from a lot of the participants here that Financial Foundation for Success has been a life changer um, for them. It's really given them that stability and confidence to, to move forward, both with home ownership, but also things like you know, replacing a bad vehicle and being able to have reliable transportation for themselves and their families. This last year, we had 54 households complete Financial Foundation for Success after moving to a fully virtual format. So that was a pretty big challenge for this class because we had the, the group classes and the one-on-one -on -one coaching, had to make sure that those were still taking place in a safe and secure way. Um, and so they, they pivoted entirely to a fully virtual format, including some courses that are recorded in order for people to kind of watch them on their own time and then check in with the coaches later. So um, some really great successes there. And this next year, their goal is 101 households. So really excited for that, nearly doubling um, the participants this next year. So this is a lot uh, of stuff, a lot of houses, a lot of repairs, a lot of education. How do we, how do we make it happen? One of the hugest ways uh, that we, are able to, to have the resources to do this is through our volunteers. Um, volunteers replace the cost of labor, which helps keep our homes affordable for Habitat families. And uh, it takes thousands of volunteer hours to help make just one home possible. Each year, we host more than 15,000 volunteer opportunities. In 2020, unfortunately, that number was basically cut in half um, because of social distancing requirements and some volunteer shutdowns at a couple times during the year. Um, we had about half the volunteer opportunities that we normally do. So we had to make up for that with uh, contracting with, with outside partners to come and do the work that volunteers normally would. So it became more expensive um, and, and more of a challenge. We estimate that 90% of our volunteers have no prior construction experience. I know when I started volunteering with Habitat years ago, I had no prior experience and um, when I, several years later, went on to buy my first home, I relied on that experience building on Habitat homes to understand what I was looking at, understand what I was getting to, and feel more comfortable working on my own home. Um, and community sponsors help us purchase land and building materials up front so our families can pay their mortgages back slowly over time. 
So we can, we can also purchase that stuff in bulk as well and reduce those costs. We also rely on philanthropic support like any nonprofit will. Um, business, faith, and individual partners support our work by uh, joining the Builder Circle, which is our, our leadership giving society for individuals who give more than $2,500 a year, sponsoring an Adopt-A-Day panel build, house, or rock the block event, and engaging their business, faith, community, or organization through volunteering and team building. An Adopt-A-Day is an opportunity for an organization or, or a faith community to sponsor a day of volunteering where we have their folks come out on site. We have some programming to help educate them about habitat and the work that they're doing. The panel build, we actually bring studs and beams and stuff to parking lots and we will build the walls of a house on site. Um, we've, we've done these in church parking lots, corporate parking lots. Uh, we did a giant shed build in the parking lot of Wells Fargo Arena a couple years ago. Um, so we, we do these all over and it's a great way to kind of localize that wherever um, the organization is and get a lot of their team members involved. A house sponsorship, you know, you're sponsoring the entire building of a house. So you're helping defray those costs so that we can keep that house cost low. And of course, we've got sponsorship recognition for all of these. In a Rock the Block event, we do uh, Rock the Block projects throughout the year, but we also have events where several times a year we'll go to a specific neighborhood and do a bunch of projects all at once. And so we'll have you know, in a normal year where we don't have social distancing and masks, we'll have a tent with 100, 150 volunteers a day that gather, select their projects, and fan out across the neighborhood to make a really big impact all over just the course of a couple of days. Um, so those are those are just some examples of our sponsorship opportunities. And um, I've, I've, as a volunteer and as a staff member, participated in all of these, and they are an absolute blast. The energy is high. Um, another way people support us is by purchasing a table at or sponsoring our annual event, the Key Awards. Um, this last year, we held our Key Awards virtually for the first time ever. Um, it was not as much fun as getting together in person and, and you know, having a glass of wine while we celebrate the year, but uh, we still had a great virtual event. And one of the things that that allowed us to do was to bring in former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Julian Castro, to speak um, to our, our supporters and, and share some of his insights on affordable housing and the crisis in America. Uh, making a one-time or monthly recurring on the donation obviously is a, is a great way to support us and giving gifts in kind such as building materials, services, or restore donations also helps uh, support our mission. Now who here has heard of the restore before, the Habitat for Humanity restore? Excellent. Do I have some restore shoppers on the call? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, obviously, if you're familiar with us, you, you may have been in the store, may have donated to us. Thank you so much for doing that. The Restore is a key part of what allows us to be successful and, and keep pumping these homes in the community and making those opportunities for people. Um, we've currently got two locations, East Euclid and Urbandale. Um, our Urbandale location is pretty close to the Homemakers Furniture. Uh, just up, up that street there, I think it's 104th. Um, our stores are now open 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday, and anybody is welcome to shop. Um, we also have online restores that are open 24-7 where you can purchase a product and then come in for curbside pickup. Um, of course, if you do that curbside pickup, you miss out on all of the excellent impulse treasure hunting that happens when you get into the store and see the neat stuff that people have donated that we have for sale. Um, of course, we accept donations of new or gently used reusable home improvements and building home improvement and building materials um, at both of our stores. And for larger donations, we have a truck that will go out and pick up those donations. Um, one, of the, one of the most interesting donation programs we have, in my opinion, is our kitchen cabinet deconstruction program. We had to put this a little bit on pause at the beginning of COVID, but it's back, back in full swing now. And this is basically, if, if you're renovating a kitchen, we will come in and have trained volunteers who will safely remove the old cabinets for donation to the ReStore and that, all of that work, all of that energy is taken on by our volunteers. And what you're left with is a fresh, uh, fresh slate ready for your new cabinets, which maybe you've purchased at the ReStore. Um, so that kitchen cabinet decon program is a, is a really great one to help people move forward on their renovation projects and save some labor. All of the, the net profits from the Habitat ReStores benefit the mission. And this last year, our ReStores were number two in the country for the amount of money returned to the mission. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the story on KCCI a week or two ago, but we are really proud of that fact. And our online stores were number one in the nation. So um, we've been working hard to, to help those succeed this year. 
and uh, boy, did they. So here we've got our, our, an example of our websites. We're going to be revamping these a little bit this spring. So you might go on and shop and see a little bit different look. We're gonna hopefully make it easier for people to find the products they need and, uh, and be excited about what they're looking for um, on the ReStore. In 2020, last year, the ReStores funded the equivalent of 12 new homes. So that's almost half of the slate of homes that we built last year was the, the funding came from the ReStore. Um, and the Urbandale Chamber of Commerce recognized the Urbandale Resort as their 2020 Business of the Year. Uh, it was just a, a fantastic year from the re, for the Resort, and we're very proud of, of the work that they do in bringing things back to the mission. Uh, one other kind of neat point, when we, in, in April and May, we had a, a few weeks where we were shut down by the gathering restrictions in, in the state. And uh, as a result of that, we had a whole bunch of Resort staff members who we could have furloughed. Instead, we, we sent them out onto the build sites. So we weren't able to have volunteers at that time. Our ReStore staff couldn't be in the store. So we had them go out and join our construction team and safely, uh, socially distanced and, and masked up and everything build and help keep that progress going. Um, so every one of our ReStore staff this year was able to get out and build on a home and contribute tangibly while they also contribute kind of tacitly through their work at the ReStore. Some of our, uh, our restore high, or excuse me, recent highlights for the affiliate in the last year, we ranked number three in the nation for families served. And the two, two uh, locations that topped us were Houston and Phoenix. So we are punching above our weight class in terms of, of impact to families served. We were number eight in the nation for tithe to help build houses in developing countries. So part of the funds that we receive, we dedicate to going out to support uh, building all across the world um, and we have specific partnerships with the Habitat affiliates in Nepal, Malawi, and El Salvador. Um, and so in a normal year, we will have trips going out to those countries where, you know, volunteers and staff members will go out and help build with them in addition to, to providing those financial resources. We benefited this last year from 24,953 volunteer hours, helping us serve a total of 302 low-income families and individuals. And since 1987, when we completed our first home, We've served more than 2,000 total families and helped more than 400 families purchase affordable homes. And way, the way that our goals are set, that 500th home will probably be in the next three years. So our pace has increased pretty dramatically, and we're really excited to, to keep that ramped up and, uh, and see that impact keep coming. This uh, next piece of information is something we actually, I actually learned about just this morning we had the, a, an impact report, economic impact report passed down to us. Um, and this was done uh, in partnership with, I, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a, a nationally recognized um, software tool that allows us to, to kind of extrapolate from our numbers and see what our actual economic impact was. So in 2019, the last year that, that we had data that we could use this for, we contributed $24 million, more than $24 million into the local economy. Um, through investing in, um, you know, our, our staff salaries, paying our vendors, um, the taxes that are paid on property taxes, on sales taxes at our stores, all kinds of things. Um, we invested more than $12 million, almost $13 million in our programs and operations. And every dollar that we uh, invested was returned to the local economy at $1.89. So really excited about um you know, the way that we aren't just impacting individual homeowners, but we're, you know, a major contributor to the local economy. We uh, supported 213 local jobs, not just through our own staff, but through third party vendors that are helping us do rock the block repairs and working on, um, you know, some of the trade work that, that gets done in our houses, like plumbing and electrical. Um, we paid more than $10 million in wages to local employees, our own and to our, our partners, and paid three quarters of a million dollars in state and local taxes. And the top industries we impacted were community food, housing and other relief services, construction of new single family residential structures and real estate sales and property management. So, you know, we're, we're very proud of the work that we do and the individuals who we impact, who we're focused on, um, but there are ripples that go out and, and touch all different parts of the community and, and help support central Iowa in a lot of different ways. How about how you can help uh, and get involved? So 
like I said, our, our work does not stop because of the cold weather, although thankfully it'll be warming up a little bit later this week. And I believe spring is coming. Uh, but you can volunteer on a construction site, on a repair site, or at one of our resources. Um, and you can visit gdmhabitat.org slash volunteer to sign up. You can donate to support our work in building homes, communities, and hope. gdmhabitat.org slash donate will provide you with all the options you need. You can advocate for policies that improve access to affordable housing in our community. This one's especially important this year where we're advocating not just for support for our work with affordable home ownership, but we're also advocating on behalf of, of renters and those who, who are already homeowners who are facing the prospect of, uh, of evictions and, and things like that, evictions and foreclosures with uh, the current economic situation. So we're advocating to make sure that resources are available to keep people in their homes right now when it's most important. So you can visit gdmhabitat.org slash advocate to sign up for our email list and get clued into what we're doing at the state house and how we're supporting uh, federal legislation as well. And then you can shop the ReStore or donate to the ReStore. Um, great deals on appliances, building materials, flooring, and more. I've got a beautiful rug in my living room that I picked up at the ReStore. Um, and it's, it's just a great place to shop. gdmhabitat.org slash ReStore will get you where you need to go. You can also follow us on social media. We're most active on Facebook and Instagram, but we do have a lot of content um, going forward on all of these platforms. So please um, find us on, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, or LinkedIn, and uh, get connected with us. So uh, does anyone have any questions about the work that we do or, or anything I can clarify for you? I have like a million questions. I was sitting here thinking of them. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> Where do you find the land? And is it, is it like in books I've read where someone comes in, applies to be someone to get a home and they get to help decide where the land is and then they get to help build their own home or they have to work on somebody's house before they ever get to build their own home? Yeah, so, uh, so we've got kind of two questions there. One, how we get our land, and two, how do our families kind of get connected or, or choose the home that they end up in? Um, so we, we get our land from a variety of sources. We'll have individuals who write us, and they've got a house or a plot of land that they want to donate um, for tax purposes or whatever reason, and we, we take those donations, and we'll turn those into to new homes. We will also buy um, vacant plots of land. We work with the city and the county to identify um, areas of opportunity that, that they have on their lists. Maybe they've um, foreclosed on a property or something like that long in the past and they've got this empty land. We will take that and turn it into, uh, into a great property. One of the challenges that we have with acquiring property is we love to do really big kind of neighborhood projects. Um, so in 2019, we completed the, the Riverbend pro project, which is a series of, of about 30 homes over three or four blocks, right, in one area. And so we had one big tract of land that we had all of these homes built, and it's got a really great neighborhood feel. And so that's one of the things that we're looking forward to and have included in our new uh, strategic plan between now and 2023, that we're going to get another one of those really big projects going. Um, but in the meantime, we're, we're working in, in on properties that we call infill. So, you know, a house is missing here or there on a street in Des Moines or, or or another uh, city and we'll work with the city or whoever owns that to purchase that property or have it donated and then uh, go ahead and build those houses. And so then how uh, a family comes to select their property, um, we go ahead and, and start our build schedules um, based on what we have seen the needs be from our families. And then um, as they move through the progress, through the, through the system and have been working on the homes, doing their sweat equity, have finished their blueprint to home ownership class, they'll come to a point at which they're ready to select their home. Um, and so then we'll take a look at the stock that we have available and the stock that we'll have being completed in the next year or so. And they'll be able to select a home that's right for their family, the right number of bedrooms, the right location, um, right style, things like that um, to work with them. So it's not exactly you know, that they go in and they pick a plot of land um, and go from there. But they do, we do um, have a lot of choice for them. Um, and once they've selected their house, they'll be able to pick you know, everything from the exterior color to some of the finishes inside um, and, and make that house really theirs. Do you have statistics? Oh, sorry. 
Danny, I have a question kind of related to that. Do yeah. do contractors or you know people who are building housing developments ever donate a lot? Yeah, occasionally we will have uh, contractors or, or developers donate a lot. Um, it kind of varies where we get those donations from. Um, we we are, are less aggressive about pursuing those, um, but we, we make sure that we let people know if you want to donate property, we're a great place to donate property to. Um, so we do have, have those partnerships. We also in the last couple of years have partnered with a, a local developer, Destiny Homes, to supplement what we're able to do with our own construction staff. Um, so Destiny has built, I think, five homes for us so far. And they're, they're within Destiny's own style. They worked with us to, to develop that. Um, but it's, it's just another great way to, to keep that pace growing um, and keep those homes building. So, yeah. Now I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, do you ever take uh, older homes and uh, re refurbish them and fix them up uh, as part of your program or not? We definitely do. Um, we, we actually, we have a couple different types of refurbishing that we do. So we have what we call rehabs and then recycles. So rehabs would be, um, you know, maybe there was, there was a home that was in pretty good shape in terms of the structural integrity of the house, but needed a lot of cosmetic updates or something like that. Um, if we were able to get a good price on it or have that donated to us, we would definitely, you know, work on that and turn that around. Um, there was, there's one example I can think of that is in the Drake neighborhood, right on, on 24th street, uh, kind of behind the Drake diner, if, if that helps. Um, so one of those beautiful old homes, I think it's a six bedroom house, just a huge house. And so we had, we had a, a family that had multiple generations living together. Um, and, and it was, uh, you know, appropriate culturally for them to stay in one house and they wanted to. And so we were able to refurbish that home and turn it into absolutely beautiful preservation of that piece of architecture and, and fit in the Drake neighborhood and also provide that bigger home uh, for that family. Um, so that's, that's rehabs and then recycles. We have uh, an agreement with our homeowners that when they, if they ever decide to purchase a new home, so, you know, maybe they need to uh, buy a new home for a growing family or generationally they get beyond and, and need to, to change that situation. They come to us and work with us and, and kind of a first right of refusal to purchase that home back from them. Um, and so we, when we do that, when we buy those homes back from them, we make sure any, any updates, any fixes that are needed to, uh, needed to be made are made. And then those homes re-enter um, the available properties for our partner families. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've volunteered with building houses for about five years. I have it now for the last five years or so, but uh, I spent quite a bit of time. We were building a lot or in a lot in that area north of University between like um, Harding Road and Second Avenue. Mm -hmm. I worked on a lot of houses in that area. Nice. Thank you very much for your work. That's Part of Vern's army, I don't know if you knew Vern Williams. Vern Williams was a little bit before my time, I think. He was a little before your time, yeah. That's part of Vern's army. Nice. There's a bunch of us that every every Wednesday we'd volunteer. Awesome. Were you a core crew member? No, I'm just part of the construction crew. Sure. Well, uh, since I brought it up, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the core crew. This is a, a group of volunteers um, they tend to be folks who have retired because they've got the time to come out on site more frequently. Um, they don't necessarily start with construction experience, but they gain it pretty quickly. And we have them come out on site. They volunteer regularly with us. They're kind of trusted hands for our construction managers, and they help sometimes guide other volunteers who are on site. So that's a great way for people to kind of make a regular impact with us and, and stay heavily involved with Habitat. We really rely on those, those volunteers for, for a lot of work. They're awesome. Well, I knew I worked with a bunch of some of those guys who were pretty regular out there and uh, did offer a lot of assistance. Yep. Great group. Polk, I think you had a question. Yeah, I have. I have several. Sorry, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I, I, too, had been a volunteer way back in. I don't think it was the early to mid 90s. We worked on the, the Habitat uh, office that was on 24th north of uh, Forest. Okay. And I remember one skill set that I 
that I've received, and I'll never, never use it again, is using the water uh, level where you have a, a tube, water uh, is in the tube, and we set a ceiling grid based, based on using that, that device. Interesting. Yeah, it is. It was. Um, we weren't working on a lot of houses in those days, and so I imagine we had a superintendent. Um, how, off, how many superintendents do you have? How many project sites do you have going on simultaneously where yeah. you probably need to have someone with some skill set on site all the time? Yeah, we, we, we have a crew of, of construction managers is the title we use for them. Okay. Um, and we have some that are dedicated to our new construction, so so building the houses, and a few that are dedicated to um, the rock the block home repairs. And so they have they have kind of a different skill set, but they'll they'll come in and support each other where necessary. For example, when we have our rock the block events, we have the, the new home construction construction managers go and help with rock the block. Um, I think for our rock the block home repairs, we have three construction managers currently. For new home construction, I think. We've, we've had a couple staff departures this last year and new hires. So I'm not exactly sure the number, but it's right around five or six. And so as a result of that, we generally have five or six homes under construction at any given time. It may be more than that though, because what, what will happen is that we will build them up to a certain point and then we'll turn them over to trades. And so we'll have plumbers and electricians and HVAC technicians um, come in and, and take care of those vital systems that, I don't know about you, but I don't know that I would trust a volunteer to run my electrical. Um, but we will we will have those trades come in and, and take care of those. And then our construction teams will come back in and complete the finish work, paint the rooms, things like that. Um, okay. So we will have some houses that are in that trade stage. So the construction manager might, you know, go off and work on another house during that time. So we keep pretty active. And to have 24 homes completed in a year, you know, you, you've got to have a pretty good pace because the homes take you know, several months each to, to build and complete. So we've got to keep yeah. that pace up. So our construction team does an excellent job. And like I mentioned, the, the Destiny Home Builder has been an excellent addition to help us keep that pace up even more. Okay, thank you. I was going to ask a question yeah. about plumbers, electricians and HVAC. Yep. Now, where is that image that is shown behind you? Where was that photo taken? <laughs> this uh, is Door County, Wisconsin. Okay. And I think I was, we were by Bailey's Harbor on the east side of the peninsula. It's beautiful, isn't Thank it? Thank you. My, beautiful. Daughter, my daughter goes there almost every President's Week vacation, or weekend, every year. It's a lovely place. She goes to the, she goes to eat a steak at, <laughs> I can't remember the name of the restaurant, something unbelievable, best place ever. I said um, Denny's and it's like, not Denny's, mom. <laughs> That's not what it is. Anyway, my question is, do you follow up with the, the families? I mean, how do you, how do you know that they make it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> how many so, people fail or whatever? We have, um, we have a, a staff, uh, we call our family services team. And so these are the folks that guide the families from the application stage all the way through their home ownership journey, which usually takes, you know, a year or two, maybe three um, to get through all of that sweat equity, all of their education and be ready to purchase the home. And that family services team does stay in touch with, with those families and, and see what they need. You know, we're available uh, to work with them if they, if they need any extra assistance. And then we also, uh, you know, this year we're doing a family survey. And so we're gathering data from all of our homeowners from the entire history, all of those 400 homes. We're gathering data from them to see how their families have done in the long term. So, you know, tell us if you bought a house in 1990, you know, how have your kids done? Have they gone off to college? Do they own homes of their own? You know, what, what, what has happened with your family and how can we track that success? And so this is the biggest initiative of its kind that we've done so far. And I'm really excited to get a hold of that data and see kind of what we can learn both about our successes, but also what can we improve on to make sure that we're making a lasting impact in, in these folks' lives. And uh, one of the, the things that, you know, you asked about, do we reach out to them? Do we make sure that they're okay? This last year was an extra uh, tough time for a lot of our families. Um, many of these, these folks were in low income jobs. So they would be kind of essential workers, frontline workers. We have a lot of folks that work at local hospitals um, as cleaning staff and, and things like that. We have some folks that work at meat packing plants. 
Um, so, you know, they were, they were exposed to a lot of these things and some of them had to, you know, miss time at work due to COVID exposure and quarantining or got COVID. Um, so it, it was a really tough time and our family services staff was in touch with them, checking in on them, making sure that, that you know, we were able to help if they, if they needed it. And another way that we help these families is that um, even though we sell some of these mortgages now, we still are the mortgage servicer. And so it's within our jurisdiction, you know, to, to work with uh, a family in the rare occasion that somebody might be late with a payment or um, have trouble making payments due to a job loss or something like that. So we are able to, you know, work out payment plans with them to, to provide them the resources to help make sure that they don't lose that home. And those circumstances are very rare, but I think it's, it's excellent and, and wonderful that we are able to step in and be that resource. Danny, yeah. if you told me this, I don't remember, but who finances your mortgages? Who finances our mortgages? So who purchases yeah. them? Yeah. We have uh, a number of, uh, of bank partners. I know Bank Iowa has, has purchased some. Um, I can't think offhand of, of the other ones. I think we've had three bank partnerships right now. And don't tell anybody, but we are uh, about to close on a partnership with Bankers Trust to purchase some of our mortgages as well. So they're, they're local banks generally. Um, and people that we're able to establish a relationship with, maybe they've already been a, you know, a panel build sponsor or um, something like that. But it's just another way to kind of take that partnership even further. Polk, I think you yeah, had one. Danny, yeah, I have, I have two. Uh, okay. uh, based on some statistics you gave us, you say we're number three in the nation for families served. Who yeah. are one and two? One and two are Phoenix and Houston this last year. Okay. okay. And then you said number eight in the nation for tithing yeah. for uh, developing. I have a, a cousin, first cousin who lives in Atlanta. She goes overseas or had gone overseas. Yep. Uh, is there anybody in the central Iowa area, Des Moines, that have done, gone overseas to developing yeah, countries? Yeah, so I'll call back to, to 2019 because 2020 is a wash as far as international travel goes. But right. in 2019, we had uh, expeditions to El Salvador, Malawi, and Nepal, all in 2019. Okay. Um, and so each one of those was, you know, between a dozen to 20 staff, volunteers, supporters of ours who would go to those countries and build with uh, the local affiliate um, in those countries. And that's in addition to that tithing support. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Also, uh, I don't think I mentioned it when I shared the restored statistic about us being number two. Um, for net return to the mission. Number one was Los Angeles. So we are yeah. very proud of who we're competing against um, and, and how we're beating some of these bigger markets. So, especially Omaha, not that I'm <laughs> So Danny, um, you talked about the financial foundation for success and that the Habitat provides uh, classes and coaching for families. Um, are the, the people that conduct those classes, are they volunteers or are they staff with Habitat? They are staff members of ours. Um, and they're actually currently, they're, they're already qualified financial counselors and, and uh, educators, but we're currently going through the process to get them officially HUD certified um, so that we have that additional kind of stamp of approval to show the quality of the financial education that we're giving. But yeah, there, there are two staff members, um, Tyler and Larissa, who just do a great job and make, make, the, um, make the classes engaging as well as educating. I, I know, you know financial topics are not always the easiest for people to grasp or the most interesting, um, but they, they try to, to, to make it easy to understand and, and easy for people to engage with, especially people coming in with kind of a low baseline of understanding for those topics. Any other questions? Oh, Danny, thank you so much. That was an excellent program. Really, I appreciate really it. Thank, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for uh, your work. Absolutely. You. Oh. And again, if, you, uh, if you're interested in learning any, anything more or um, taking one of those action steps, you can get started right at gdmhabitat.org. Um, at the beginning of March, we're coming out with a brand new website, so it'll be even, even easier to, to navigate and get access to what you need to. So go ahead and give us a click. Great, thanks so Bye. much, Danny. Have a great day.
Thank I'll, you. I'll say this, Danny. It was a great experience, and you did learn an awful lot about uh, building houses. Absolutely. I, I, I'm so proud of the work we do and, um, and the way in which we do it. All right, y'all have a great day. Thanks so much. <laughs>